Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Downis Hours, the Director at Large of the Association of Baltic Studies. And, and on behalf of our board, I'd like to welcome you today to this webinar, which um, addresses the full-scale war in Ukraine as a potential move towards decolonization. Now, decolonization refers to resisting Russia and asserting new identities and subjectivities. We're going to be asking which processes of decolonization are taking place in Ukraine and the Baltic states? What will be the impact of this war on challenging imperial hierarchies and in international relations? And what will be its impact on domestic developments? These and many other questions will be tackled by a very distinguished panel that we've put together today. Uh, Nadia Koval is a foreign and security policy analyst currently heading the Department of Research, Analytics and Academic Programs at the Ukrainian Institute, Ukraine's key cultural diplomacy institution. And she's also a lecturer in European integration at the Kiev School of Economics. Uh, Andrei Behinsky is Associate Professor of Sociology at Igor Sikorsky Kiev Polytechnic Institute and one of the developers and the lecturer of the educational program on conflict resolution and mediation, which trains specialists in conflict resolution in the socio-political sphere. Maria Malikso is a professor of international relations at the Department of Political Science, University of Copenhagen, where she focuses on memory politics, critical security studies, and international relations theory. And the webinar will be moderated by the gentle hands of Thomas Pildegovich, who is a senior expert at the NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. Now, before I hand over to Thomas, just uh, a quick word on questions. Please note that the chat is disabled on this Zoom, but we would welcome your questions to be submitted via the Q&A, the question and answer button and then they will be uh, redirected to the moderator. And with that, uh, Thomas, uh, these short words of welcome, I now hand over moderation of the panel to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Awers. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very glad that we have uh, friends following our discussion everywhere from uh, Riga to New York. Uh, now, Professor, Ours uh, has already alluded to some of the key questions that we'll be scrutinizing in our discussion. And uh, really, I think we're quite fortunate uh, today because our speakers bring a really wide uh, range of expertise, uh, which will be instrumental to examining the processes of decolonization taking place in Ukraine and the Baltic states. Uh, I know that I'm not alone in uh, my frustrations regarding how Russia-centric um, the coverage of the Russia-Ukraine war has been at times. Uh, and in this discussion, I'm sure that we will break the spell because we have a variety of perspectives, both from Ukraine uh, and the Baltics. Now, let's get to the best part. Uh, I would like to begin with introductory remarks from each of our speakers uh, around four or five minutes each uh, to sketch out their vantage point uh, on these issues. Uh, Nadia, perhaps um, you could go first. Um, perhaps I could ask for your perspective uh, as a Ukrainian scholar on how the Russia-Ukraine war has been covered in Western academic circles. Has uh, anything been encouraging to you? Uh, or is there a, a part of the story that is missing? And uh, perhaps if I can already provoke a bit, have you heard any analyses or any takes that have, ma that have made your blood boil? Uh, Nadia, I give the floor to you. Good evening, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here on such an important topic of decolonization in times of war. And uh, actually, in my intervention, I would like to consider how the war raised this necessity of decolonizing the knowledge order concerning Ukraine and other countries of Central Eastern Europe, including Baltics, that actually governs in humanities and social sciences of many 
Western countries through creation of specific epistemic communities, through training experts in the regional affairs in a certain way, and providing an exchange of knowledge of the so-called periphery states with former imperial centers. So this knowledge order is, of course, reflected in structural challenges and inequality of representation in knowledge production and results uh, its results from Ukraine's post-colonial situation. And uh, later, it is reflected in often uncritical acceptance of the Russia-centered and Russia-originated in essence colonial approaches and interpretation of the region as objective and factual. So we have many blank spots, many outright distortions. And of course, coming closer to your question, this becomes even more salient uh, in the situation of war, not least because of the close relationship between academic studies and expert knowledge in the international relations and political decision make, uh, making, actually. Uh, I would like to start with the example not of the current phase of the war, but uh, with our study we, uh, we, together with some colleagues, made in 2020. Uh, there was a study of uh, academic and think tank discourse on the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, the phase that happened between 2014 and 2019, uh, and we like uh, read everything that has been published, okay, almost everything. <laughs> on the Russia-Ukraine war uh, in uh, academic discourse and think tank discourse. And actually, uh, it remains instructive for today because we have singled out six cross-country narratives about the causes, nature of the conflict, and the preferred ways of conflict resolution. And today, looking at that corpus of knowledge with the benefit of hindsight, there is nothing strange that the all-out invasion in 2022 came out as a surprise for a, quite a part for, of intellectual community worldwide. And among these six key narratives that we have identified, the first told that in 2014, Russian aggression happened, unlawful annexation on the part of territory of Ukraine, and this should be met by deterrence and strict adherence to international law. And this kind of narrative at that time was dominant in academic and intellectual production of one country only, and that would be Poland. And the rest of the narratives, I wouldn't enumerate all of them, but the idea was that they proposed mild, milder dialogue and compromise-based solutions of the conflict or shifted large portions of the blame and responsibility from Russia to other players, primarily Ukraine itself, the US, the collective US, and who else. And what was peculiar to these milder narratives in different degree, but still, uh, and what truly had a colonial origin was a, an appeal to certain exceptionality of Ukrainian case due to its uh, hugely overblown deep historical, cultural, and psychological connections with Russia. It was exacerbated in numerous cases by non-use of local sources, extremely liberal treatment of basic facts, selective treatment of problems of radical right or pervasive corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this exceptionalism was what often went as far as to suggest that the natural state for Ukraine would be its limited sovereignty that might be compromised upon for the sake of stability and peace. And probably what... Uh, made my eyes bleed uh, was read <laughs> at that time in this corpus of text because actually with the, after the um, full-scale invasion the situation somehow uh, became better so we do not have as distorted narrations about this war as we had in the previous time but still you can hear these repercussions uh, uh, even in today's uh, debate and in most cases, this is not some nefarious direct propaganda. It's mostly due to a structural problem, uh, to the fact that this Russia-centered and Russia-originated regional studies produce uh, actually a, a certain corpus of knowledge that reads the region, its history and present. And it brings me to my second example, because last year in, here in Ukrainian Institute, we made research on the state and prospects of Ukrainian studies in the world. And uh, among the report's conclusions were those that the Ukrainian studies in any form, because we took both the single standing star study st centers of Ukraine and uh, in the some regional framework, which actually are more numerous, uh, but still in any form, they are virtually absent in huge parts of the world, like Africa, South America, a large part of East and South of East Asia, including India and Middle East and so on and so forth. So in some regions of the world, the expertise on the our region does not even look beyond Russia, which again influences current understanding of events and subsequent policy choices and uh, 
Again, we can see this in this um, phase of the war. And as for the Ukrainian studies in the West, more than half of them happen in these regional studies centers, Slavic, Eurasian, post-Soviet, post-communist, and so on. And of course, there are also centers that are regional in name, but uh, do not cover Ukraine for different reasons. All those experts from those centers cover Ukraine related questions in public commentary, for instance. Uh, so as you have already mentioned, most of these uh, region centered research centers are still dominated by Russian studies, which again uh, contribute uh, to reproducing some Russian discourses and safeguarding the uh, status quo. And the problem is that while the mainstream colonial studies have done much for the deconstruction of this flow of knowledge orders developed in the course of Western colonialism, well, at least there is a good awareness on this thing. In the Eastern of Central Europe case, the process has indeed been initiated in 2022, but in my opinion, uh, the results as of mid-2023, they're quite moderate. There is still reluctance to use this colonial lens due to a number of reasons, starting with some structural differences between Western and Russian colonialism, uh, or let's say in the tendency to see USSR and Russia as an allied colonial struggle, and as anti-imperial liberating force, even in current conditions in some countries, it's uh, and in some, let's say, intellectual circles, uh, circles, it still holds. And the fact that Russia itself actively promotes its foreign policy and culture visions doesn't help much and feeds some discourses. So uh, uh, just to conclude, uh, on a more practical level, um, the, stakeho uh, the stakeholders are also wary of, of any abrupt changes. Uh, they uh, uh, have some fear of losing teachings, research positions, long established contacts, access to usual sources, de developing previous lines of research, and so on and so forth. But the fair thing is the change in the approaches that would benefit both Ukrainian and Baltic regional Russian studies, because indeed the fact that global academia was twice struck with the surprise of first like uh, with USSR collapse 30 years ago and then with 2022 invasion of Ukraine, it's telling that not only coverage of Ukraine is just uh, or unjust or accurate or not accurate, but actually the quality of the knowledge formation about the Russia itself has some structural problems to be addressed. And I will stop it here. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, this really resonated with me on on several levels. I have all sorts of uh, follow up questions uh, for you, but uh, first uh, we must uh, continue with the opening remarks. Um, Andri, perhaps uh, I could turn to you. Uh, could I ask for your insight on how Ukraine has maybe worked to overcome or mitigate these sorts of uh, colonial biases, these sorts of colonial structures uh, since the invasion? And uh, perhaps uh, there's something that Nadia said that uh, particularly resonated with you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Thomas. And uh, warm greetings from Kiev uh, to the audience and to the colleagues. And uh, I will try to say some words about maybe a strategic approach to a Russia-Ukrainian war in the context of decolonization. Uh, so uh, the background of the conflict is important here because uh, taking into account the beginning of the 20th century that was marked by crisis developments of the global world order, Russia's strategy in the conflict with Ukraine uh, can be viewed as an asymmetrical challenge to the Western world. And this asymmetry is presented in Russia lower military potential compared to NATO. But it was balanced by hybrid means of warfare information and economic in the first place. And via leading this hybrid phase of the war in Crimea in this in 2014-2021, Russia has never abandoned its main scenario of occupying all Ukrainian territories. And the reliance of such a you know shameful peace, the Minsk agreements, according to which Ukraine had to give up the sovereignty of its territories only advanced the implementation of the main scenario. And it quickly became that Ukraine it became clear that Ukraine would not settle the concessions of the mixed two agreement. So um, as the military conflict phase characterized by Russia's militarization, mobilization of public opinion regarding the full scale of war in information and propagandist uh, playing, as Nadia already mentioned, spending resources on subversive intelligence gathering and military technical activities in Ukraine. Whereas Ukraine uh, was also mobilizing its own social resources to develop a network of volunteers 
helping its armed forces transition to NATO standards uh, in the management uh, of uh, a structure of armed forces. So introduce weapons, particularly national technologies as well. And hence, we see that each side was employing the number of social resources available at the time and in a way that provisioned escalation of confrontation in the next phase. But uh, I think that Ukraine's strategic goal um, is uh, to defend its national sovereignty and statehood, injure opportunities for its socio-economic and political development. Military and social mobilization are backed by significant public support and also some consolidation of the political elite regarding the continuation of military actions until Ukraine wins. So one of the maybe significant explanatory elements of the Russia, of Russia's strategy here and uh, the context is of conversation is all, uh, also important here that Russia ha always uh, has some strategic culture in Russia, Ukraine and war. So Russia's discourse is based not only on its status as a country leader, uh, of the world order, but its great powerness on the territories of the post-Soviet region in the first place. And in this context, Ukraine plays a major value role as Russia sees Ukraine's territory as a defense shield for its national security interests against the West, as well as symbol of Russia in trench use on its existence as a great state. So Russia's strategic view is a result of radical narratives of the way Ukraine and its cooperation with the West were represented by Kremlin officials. In turn, this, this is important interpretation of the means of Russia political and military strategy in the war and on the global stage. So we see such uh, some kind of strategic priorities of Russia Federation at the level of ideological discourse also. So uh, we heard about um, some local identities on the vast regions and Russia always tries to oppose them to ideological messages of Ukraine's central government. Another key mechanism of Russia's strategy in the Russia-Ukraine war is to constantly injure tendencies of blurring the lines between war and peace. And from uh, 2014 till February the 24th, 2022, such manipulation and substitution of concepts allowed Russia to interpret the Russia-Ukraine war as a civil war. And um, it was in, in international level, hence international community treated it as a domestic conflict between the central government and authorities from Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Therefore, the war was commonly regarded as some kind of Ukrainian crisis and Russia, the particular case, was not seen as an aggressor or belligerent, uh, but rather a mediator, which allowed Russia authorities to avoid international criminal liability for starting the war against or against Ukraine. So such development of events enabled Russia to significantly build up its military potential over the course of eight years, preparing to launch a full-scale war in Eastern Europe with ambition to change the world order in the future. But uh, maybe some words about Ukraine's strategy here and the military component of this strategy in the Russia-Ukrainian war is presented uh, in the article by the uh, was published last year, the article of the commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, Valery Zaluzhny, and people's deputies of Ukraine, Mikhail Zabrowski. It's called uh, Prospects for Running a Military Campaign in 2023, Ukraine's Perspective. And the authors point out that the basis of Ukraine's successful military campaign was laid by significant volumes of military and technical assistance from Western countries, uh, countries this assistance is used uh, and will be used to successfully counterattack the enemy, taking into account such disproportions in the resources between the Russian and Ukrainian armies. The point which the authors particularly stress, they think that the fi uh, fighting Russians' impunity for their actions and inflicting strikes on legitimate charges on the enemy's territory will be the next top priority task of the armed forces of Ukraine. The military component of Ukraine's strategy is connected with the intensification of diplomatic efforts. After February the 24th, 2022, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitry Kuleba, uh, as well as Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Alexei Reznikov, it's a former uh, minister, held dozens of hours of negotiations with allies to ensure an uninterrupted supplies of weapons, resulting in the implementation of the Rammstein format 
the regular meetings of defense ministers to discuss and provide Ukraine with military and technical assistance. It should be said that the Rammstein, also known as the Ukraine Defense Contract Group, provides consolidated, systematic, and consistent military support to Ukraine by promptly responding to the request of the armed forces of Ukraine for armament, military equipment, and ammunition. The political element of the format showcases an unprecedented anonymity of more than 50 countries in support of Ukraine and its people. So, modernization of the armed force of, uh, force of Ukraine in the course of the war is an important factor in the foreign relations and is becoming a strategic uh, goal. Apart from intensive cooperation uh, with its long-term partners, Ukraine is establishing a dialogue with the countries with which diplomatic cooperation was not active in previous years. Uh, you know that this is African and Asian countries, uh, and uh, they are also in the focus of Ukraine issues now. So the votes in the United Nations proof of overwhelming support of Ukraine in the war by the majority of the member states of General Assembly, while the end is working on the international legal framework for Russia to be held accountable for its aggressive revision. And maybe going to the conclusion, we can see that the period from 2014 uh, to 2022 was a preparatory one of more intensive war, but it transformed the Ukrainian army into a more combat effective state and consolidated Ukrainian political lead around the idea of confronting the enemy. So proactive diplomacy and efficient information campaign campaigns become Ukraine's advantage, while Russia propaganda was the only effective in mobilizing public opinion in support of the war in Ukraine. So the trend is to strengthen strategic capabilities will be increasing uh, in the latter half of the 2020s and Russia will be losing its economic, political and social capabilities in an environment where Ukraine is supported by a significant number of allies, where Russia is constrained under pressure of sanctions and the only conditions for the end of the war will be for Russia government to reinterpret re their military goals and objectives. So, so uh, Maria, uh, I'm very excited to hear your perspective on what the Russian war of aggression has taught us about kind of biases or epistemic different types of habits or filters that we have, uh, both in international politics and in the academic IR. Uh, you, of course, have researched uh, such phenomena, uh, kind of this neglect of uh, perspectives of perceived marginal subject long before the invasion. So. Uh, I must ask, uh, do you somehow feel uh, vindicated, if that is the right word? And uh, if I could ask you already in your introduction uh, to react to this problem that Nadia alluded to, that uh, Ukrainian studies are often subsumed under regional centers uh, of expertise, which are generally Russia-centric and therefore reproduce Russia-centric uh, discourses. Is this something that you have noticed in your academic work also? Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for uh, this invitation and, and for this opportunity. I think, uh, in a way, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very uh, almost preposterous to search for silver linings uh, against the backdrop of, of uh, catastrophes of, of the scale uh, the, that, uh, that we are all witnessing to various degrees, such as this ongoing war. But one of the obvious silver linings is the fact that actually we have had so many more of such, uh, you know, fora, so many more of such gatherings where we actually also extensively hear from the Ukrainian colleagues, which I think is, is already, you know, uh, a proof in and of itself of this conversation uh, going on and, and some kind of uh, um, flexing of, of the usual uh, conversation par partners and parties uh, happening as we speak, right? So I think why this is also uh, important is that we learn via these fora uh, how differently we even uh, name uh, what is going on, right? Because here I, I noticed that uh, every one of the speakers before me talks about uh, Russia uh, or Russia-Ukraine war, which is uh, in that sense obviously putting the aggressor first, but also not not um, deleting Ukrainian agency from the process, which is very much, you know, the choice that was uh, the preference of uh, Serhii Plochi, for instance, as well. Whereas in uh, in the Western fora, it's very common to refer to war in Ukraine, which is pretty vague, 
or the Ukraine war, uh, which is uh, even worse, right? Uh, so I guess, you know, this, this in and of itself is indicative. But very broadly speaking, when we talk about the epistemic frames and habits, uh, I guess, mm, you know, one thing all of us in Eastern Europe uh, have uh, been living with, right, is this perennial uh, talk about uh, Russia's legitimate security interests. This is one of the late motifs of my discipline, of the discipline of international relations. Now, this is also an interesting trope, which suggests effectively that, you know, the big ones have legitimate security interests, whereas the ones that are in the sphere of their interests somehow, you know, do not, um, are not eligible for such legitimacy, right? Uh, so this is something that obviously uh, is being also revised, uh, I think, in the mindscapes uh, of the many parties of this uh, conversation and of this decolonization process. Because I think when we talk about uh, decolonizing effects of this war, we have to indeed acknowledge that, yes, there is the struggle that is happening in the battlefield, which is de facto a multi-party. Uh, struggle, even if you know the the direct participation of of the West is 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 not really there. Um, but we also have the struggle in the mindscapes, and and there I think uh, you know we have to also ask questions about what is the role of um, well East European subalterns uh, who are themselves decolonizing as we speak. What is their role in in uh, sort of bringing about uh, this knowledge um, and the, the dangers of seeing the region only through the Russia-centric frame to the West, broadly speaking, but also to the to the East, right? So, so these these questions are are very important. Uh, um, and in my opinion, when I try to sort of look at the at the plus side of things, which I usually always struggle with, I think this epistemic reflex of viewing our region, so to speak, through the Russia provided frames or exclusively through the Russia provided frames has definitely become uh, stirred as a result of the war already, if not quite fully shaken, right? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's completely uh, clear that uh, Ukraine um, has emerged uh, as uh, an agent uh, in the mindscapes uh, of you know, those who, who perhaps previously did not pay attention or did not realize that it was something uh, you know, of its own volition and will. Uh, it's a place, it's a country uh, with agency that it has indeed won with a very high price because of very boldly, uh, uh, decisively resisting this aggression. That doesn't, of course, mean that there isn't still a pretty uh, considerable army of uh, who you could call Putin's willing uh, executioners on the disinformation uh, front in the West as well. I mean, um, people who are called uh, in the slang of the Twitterverse as the Vatnik soup. I mean, uh, also people uh, perhaps uh, uh, in, in, among the IR scholars. And then, uh, you know, when we, when we look at this crowd, then we of course also see that uh, one of these uh, die-hard uh, epistemic reflexes is, is, is the unwillingness to call things by their name. And instead, you know, the... the attempt to talk about, you know, ideas that are very difficult to argue with, such as, you know, peace. But calling for peace uh, or, or the aspiration for peace when the aggression is ongoing inevitably has a very sour taste, right? And, and I think it's also, um, it's also an instance of, uh, of effectively failing or, or actually actively refusing to embrace what is the actual nature of this uh, ongoing conflict. It's, it's a genocidal war uh, of attempted recolonization on Russia's part, which I think in political terms also very simply dictates this imperative of, you know, for Ukraine, of course, to resist the aggressor with everything in its power, but also for its Western partners. And obviously, particularly, you know, for us in the region who, who um, have the historical uh, sensibility 
uh, and, and experience of what it means. And this is where this epistemic hierarchy and, and also the responsibility of uh, the collective East, so to speak, comes in, I think. It's, it's resisting this, this um, um, sort of ingrained understanding in the field of international relations that basically <clears throat> the, the large ones are the only ones who, who have this privileged access to, to, uh, to making sense of the other large ones, such as Russia in this case. But de facto, it's obviously not the case. And we have very strongly seen that in the context of uh, everyone being uh, rather surprised, uh, not least also in, in IR, about, uh, you know, how could something like this, how could a war or an aggression of that kind happen at this time uh, of the 21st century? So it does not, size and capability in material terms, does not translate directly into privileged understanding. And this is, I think, where, you know, there's this uh, healthy reminder of also the very practical need to revise the epistemic habits. Um, but I guess I should probably stop here so that we would have time for, for uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think this really uh, sets us up uh, in a very promising way uh, for the discussion. Uh, I would uh, first like to, uh, I, I must also remind everyone that, of course, uh, you can ask your questions uh, via the Q&A uh, function. Uh, this is for those of, uh, those of you listening. Um, so, Nadia, uh, what I would like uh, to ask you is, um, with reference to this tendency that uh, we can often see in Western academic political circles to kind of uh, romanticize Russia, uh, particularly when it comes uh, to its uh, kind of cultural uh, cultural appeal. Uh, Putin uh, has done a lot to burn this capital uh, and uh, wreck uh, Russia's image, uh, perhaps beyond repair. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I was hoping you could uh, maybe discuss how Russia has instrumentalized or weaponized culture and uh, whether you feel that the West has now sufficiently woken up uh, to this and uh, invested in, in resilience or whether uh, we are we are still sleepwalking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I would like first to very quickly reflect on what Professor Balkso said about naming the war. Uh, in the research that I have mentioned in my presentation, we also uh, research what was the naming of the conflict. Yes, I, I uh, me personally, I prefer Russian-Ukrainian war, but when we looked. Uh, throughout the seven countries that we have chosen uh, in 2014, 2019, like absolutely predominant, this is called Ukrainian crisis. This was not 100% uh, um, uh, for instance, for English language, we had also Ukraine crisis, Ukraine war and so on and so forth. But for instance, for France, for Greece, for Germany, Ukrainian crisis, Ukrainian crisis, Ukrainian crisis with this hint that this is just a temporary crisis in relations between uh, great powers, or this is some internal political crisis with all the frames uh, that stem from uh, this. So now with this war in Ukraine, we have a bit upgraded, yes, but not too much because as we all know, it's a uh, full, full scale war. Uh, and uh, this is not the war in Ukraine, this is war with Ukraine, but still uh, naming uh, is also a very important part of this colonizing and decolonizing move. And as to the role of culture, it's a tricky question because uh, even now, even on the second year of invasion, uh, the question uh, is, cu can culture be instrumentalized or is culture actually something benign, something that can bring us peace, something that does not uh, actually uh, have relation to this word? It's still a very acute uh, question and there are, there are still a lot of instances where uh, the culture is treated like separately from politics, uh, but uh, the thing is that for Russia it isn't, and uh, 
one our most re recent research uh, from 2022 was about how Russia actually instrumentalizes uh, culture for political and uh, war-related reasons. And we have studied all major Russian soft power organizations that uh, mm -hmm. uh, exist in this country and were established exactly after the um, colored revolutions uh, in Eastern European countries and with the proclamation on the of the course of reintegration of the Soviet Empire in the end of the uh of um yes uh 2000 and since that time culture has been very actively uh used for different political um uh, purposes and uh what is uh, most uh, like probably shocking for some observers uh is that the three uh, most uh important russian uh organizations used for soft power promotion cultural diplomacy international humanitarian cooperation namely the state agency rasatrunichestva government organized non government organization the ruski mir foundation and gorchakov fund they are very directly uh taking part uh in this um uh, actually war and Rosatrudnichestva is of course uh, as uh, extreme uh, case uh, it's implicated in many war related activities it's like it first of all it provides facilitates or promotes humanitarian aid from from Rosatrudnichestva and its partners including the Minister of Defense in Russia to the Ukrainians who are currently residing in the occupied uh, territories to the Ukrainians who are evacuated or deported in Russia so uh, they just take part in uh, colonizing, actually, the newly acquired uh, lands. Secondly, this organization produces and spreads war-related narratives as to the why the war has happened, to who is responsible, uh, which war crimes have been purportedly, and so on and so forth. And uh, it promotes very actively war symbolics. It organizes manifestations and rallies in different countries. It... Uh, invests enormous resources into combating Russophobia and Russia canceling uh, here in Nadia, the sphere yeah, of I just, culture. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I just, perhaps I could ask you to wrap up uh, shortly. Uh, yes, so this is, um, uh, to wrap up, I would just like to say that the first strategic document in foreign policy that was uh, adopted by Russia since the start of all out invasion was the concept of Russian information policy abroad, which uh, says us directly that culture is an instrument of policy, instrument of improving Russia's image abroad, and instrument uh, for gaining other uh, political goals of this country. So I think this is uh, part of Russian foreign activities that we should all pay attention to. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Andri, we could actually kind of continue on this thread a bit. Uh, so uh, Maria in her previous uh, intervention mentioned struggles not on the battlefield, but in mindscapes. And now Nadia brought up uh, Russian kind of information policy abroad and uh, this kind of promoting very its narratives very strategically, uh, including um, narratives regarding the Russian-Ukrainian war. And you mentioned Africa several times. Uh, so, uh, where Russia has, of course, uh, kind of effectively maneuvered and tried to position itself as uh, some sort of uh, ally in the anti-colonial struggle and kind of fomenting, uh, fomenting anti-Western uh, sentiment. Uh, do you have any insight into kind of oh, if uh, Ukraine and perhaps its Western partners have been sufficiently engaged in uh, counteracting these narratives? Uh, are we simply absent from the debate or are there other reasons why why Russia is succeeding with these audiences? Uh, yeah, thank you, Thomas. I, I think that Ukraine like became more successful in this informational work to uh, uh, African and maybe also Asian countries. And not long ago, that um, talking directly was not a priority for Ukrainian diplomacy to work with all these countries because that was like a first line with our dealing with Western countries and with Russia, and that was some kind of train leech diplomatic uh, in our political discourse. But today the situation changed and the war changed the situation, and we can see different informational formats like uh, dialogue platforms, 
uh, visits of our diplomats and of our officials to African countries. They visit Kiev also. So uh, this uh, work uh, became more like it's in intensified here. And, but also Russia do not stop. Uh, they try to uh, continue their influence uh, in African countries. And you know that they use paramilitary organizations such as Wagner Group there uh, just to uh, control maybe even some or try to make an impact on some governments in African countries because a lot of these countries um, have a lot of resources and Russia also tried to make some economic intervention in these countries. So maybe it's like it's a new field uh, on the battlefield in the international way. And uh, maybe we will see in the nearest future some new step uh, in the, on the hand of Ukrainian diplomacy in such a way. Uh, thank, thank you for this. Uh, my, uh, turning to you, uh, you had this kind of uh, bold uh, statement that uh, as a result of the invasion, kind of Ukraine became an agent. Uh, and I'm curious whether, uh, in your view, uh, mirroring processes have taken place in the Baltic states. And uh, perhaps, so kind of, could you discuss how this invasion has maybe accelerated some decolonization forces uh, in the Baltics? Uh, and perhaps as a second layer, so kind of, how are these uh, East European subalterns taking decolonization forward maybe outside of just intellectual discourses and i have to say that your questions are so good that one would need a mini lecture to to answer them but also thank you lea garcia for this excellent question so yes uh, i think uh, definitely we've seen this intensification and this is also for the reason of what i previously mentioned and what uh, uh, our uh, good colleague Davila Budrite has called, you know, th th this war being the vicarious war, also perhaps particularly for the Baltic states and Poland. Um, and I think when we talk about, you know, decolonizing as a process, uh, that refers to basically relieving oneself of the past oppression, but also its present legacies, then, you know, we've seen manifold uh, features of that in the Baltic states. Some are, you know, the sort of classical militant democracy wartime features, such as uh, sort of relating to the regulation of the future memory or me memory in the making uh, regarding, you know, Russia's spread of disinformation uh, about the wartime. Uh, well, I mean, you know, basically spreading um, uh, narratives about the war that could not be further from the factual truth. This is something that another good colleague who I know is is in the room, um, part of our Memocracy project, uh, has just finalized a long report about, you know, the, the Baltic memory laws and actions that have been adopted as a result of this war. So there have been these sort of uh, bans, uh, you know, restrictions. There are also features that we might call militant memocracy features which relate to the monumental politics sort of cleaning the the space of of uh, the things that uh, are uh, active um, uh, reminders of the soviet era you know there is this uh, tank uh, model in narva that uh, created much uh, um, uh, well you know much much um, uh, emotions, many emotions, actually, uh, in the Estonian context. But I think w this this is all done. This is, in a way, almost to be predicted. That's also part of the democratic process. Uh, for, for the Baltic states, you can't, I guess, quite say that this uh, reclaiming of agents in the political sense is quite comparable um, to Ukraine's, because they, in a way, obviously came out of this, this uh, big... Uh, historical process of the collapse of the USSR slightly better uh, and and hence you know had a certain advantage but I want to come back to quickly to this question of of you know the the de um, colonizing or reclaiming agency via other means not just tweaking the the discourse or not just you know renaming our academic centers of study uh, I think it's interesting to note that we have actually seen the three Baltic states really taking initiative 
when it comes to these accountability debates that also, uh, Andre, uh, you touched upon, that they have uh, really hammered on this idea that we need a special international uh, tribunal uh, uh, for, for the Russia's crime of aggression. And I think this is also an instance of how, you know, we see the Baltic states vicariously dealing with what they never had. It's a sort of delayed Nuremberg for the crimes, you know, Russia as the continuator state of the USSR has never held accountable for. Uh, so in that sense, obviously, there is also this, you know, you could say uh, emotional investment, self-interest um, uh, involved. Uh, uh, but but I think it's it's notable that, you know, politically they have taken the lead. And, and we've also seen, uh, for instance, um, uh, proposals coming precisely from the region again um, uh, for the EU to use the frozen assets of Russia to rebuild Ukraine. So these are the practical examples. Uh, Nadia, I uh, do not uh, envy you uh, because uh, we've just uh, received a really sophisticated question uh, from the audience uh, that will be sent uh, your way. Uh, and the question uh, reads, um, how should scholars address the ambiguity with Ukraine? On one hand, being a legitimate part of the post-colonial space, yet on the other, also having a strong alignment with the West thus alienating it uh, from the global south. Uh, well, I think uh, we should deal it in the same way as the scho scholars of the global south and the, of Western colonials in the global south should also deal with Russian colonialism. So uh, in a way, uh, we should refrain from this simplistic um, well, let's say schemas in which, for instance, uh, for currently for global South uh, African and other countries uh, like um, Russia is a kind of uh, of an ally and uh, uh, enjoys a very good um, press and image from the times of USSR as, as their ally in post uh, in decolonial struggle and their ally in nation building and so on and so forth. And thus, they just uh, often do not uh, want to see the state uh, in their role of colonizers. So the question is that different structures on power and influence, uh, they are much more complicated uh, than we would like to see in some uh, very, very simplistic um, schemas. Decolonization from one big power can sometimes mean recolonization of recolonization by some other power. So uh, getting free from some dependencies does not uh, actually prevent you from not falling into new dependencies. So the solution would be uh, like uh, academic integrity and uh, willingness uh, to take into account different patterns of Col colonial and other influences, both for us as decolonizing uh, our knowledge and for, for our counterparts. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, so uh, in the final uh, block, I would like for us to kind of collectively a bit uh, move away from the theoretical and touch upon uh, the practical uh, against the backdrop of a so-called uh, Ukraine fatigue or war fatigue, uh, which is demonstrably weaponized by politicians in several countries, right? I mean, US, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, uh, all come to mind re in, recent, uh, in recent weeks, uh, which I find not only kind of reckless and dangerous, but also this notion of Ukraine fatigue, I find it absurd because uh, the only ones who should be experiencing fatigue are the Ukrainians uh, who continue to uh, sacrifice and, uh, of course, uh, die uh, every single day. Uh, so, dear panelists, uh, I would like to give uh, each of you uh, a couple minutes. Uh, what is the way forward uh, in terms of pr practical, tangible support for uh, scholars and universities in Ukraine and uh, more broadly for uh, Ukraine's uh, war effort? Uh, I think we can begin with Andri this time. Uh, well, like a lecture uh, on the educational program, I can say that 
uh, it's very important to support education and science in Ukraine and maybe it becomes a guarantee of both peaceful development of Ukraine and stability and resilience of the Ukrainian state and our partners have proven that their commitment to Ukraine and the large amounts of financial resources, international projects for recovery is an example for that. Uh, but in my opinion, it is possible to further strengthen you know, scientific cooperation, academic mobility, maybe both at the level of university and in the individual levels. So quality education will provide Ukrainian youth with the opportunity to stay in the country and also an opportunity to rebuild it. Yes, I, I can only in that sense resonate that uh, I think the, some initiatives that have worked really well, uh, such as the Central uh, European Universities, Invisible University for Ukraine, and 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 uh, you know again these sorts of engagements and continuing them. Uh, and not just, you know, for, I mean, not foremost in the symbolic reasons, but these have, I think, very practical, uh, practical value also on the daily basis for people, but not just, you know, for, for the people who are currently in the most difficult circumstances, that is, you know, Ukrainians uh, in, in Ukraine. But I think there is obviously also this very practical value uh, because of learning from the source uh, for, 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 you know, everyone else. So in that sense, there there is absolutely no 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 other way uh, in uh, in moving um, in moving forward. Um, I think when we talk about uh, you know one of these these uh, themes that also has popped up very frequently uh, in the interactions between uh, various political players when discussing this war, one of these themes has been that yes, we should have listened uh, to to you know certain east europeans about uh, assessments um, uh, about reading russia uh, and we have to also make sure that this sort of uh, understanding doesn't remain a fleeting uh, sort of nodding uh, in the direction of yes you got something right but let's now move on um, uh, in that sense there can't be uh, going back to business as usual also in terms of these these old patterns of of thinking uh, and habitual ways of of thinking so uh i actually think that we had uh, quite an amazing uh, number of different scholarship and other support for ukrainian scholars and other intellectuals uh, both in ukraine because a lot of us stay there and those who were forced to dislocate. And uh, this is absolutely marvelous. And we are, of course, very grateful. I think uh, this next step should be actually making a step further and uh, change these approaches, change these approaches to research in uh, Western countries, uh, approaches to the region, approaches to uh, Russia and so on and so forth. Because only when we step from this individual help, uh, in individual problem, to reconsidering on what we know of the region, how we know of the region, then people in these regions would not experience like Ukraine fatigue, Poland fatigue, Baltics fatigue. Because if you, for instance, uh, have an understanding why this conflict is uh, important, why is it important for you, for your country to support uh, the support to Ukraine, you can't get um, actually very fatigued from that. So uh, the, uh, the very important thing is actually to think about this war and this conflict as something that concerns uh, all of us, and not only rhetorically, but in, in real life. Then you can, as a, polit as a populist politician also, like some of the mentioned people, explain to your people why is it essential actually to continue this support, why is this essential for Russia to get punished uh, for what it has done and to restore some justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Uh, I think that is uh, a very, very kind of uh, uplifting uh, note uh, on which uh, to wrap up. Uh, I am confident that this was uh, an hour well spent, and I think this should really be the basis or, or even inspiration uh, for future uh, exchange. Uh, I think just as uh, Baltic governments have taken a leadership role in supporting Ukraine on the battlefield and with military and political aid, and just as 
Baltic people have supported the Ukrainian people by opening their homes and donating and so forth. I think in that very same spirit, uh, Baltic researchers and scholars must show uh, solidarity with Ukrainian counterparts and uh, promote each other's uh, perspectives in Western institutions, uh, conferences, journals, uh, and other um, other sources of, uh, of, of knowledge production. Uh, on this note, uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, who tuned in and uh, really hope uh, to also see you at future events. Thank you very much.